Good morning, everyone. It's always such an honor to be with you. I'm glad to be here. I went to a concert last night in Orlando, so I got home incredibly late. So I don't know if I'm coming or going. It's a good thing I've got everything written down. Let us prepare now to come into the presence of God by taking a moment of silence so that we can make our own individual private confessions. Anyone who stands with Christ and is born again is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. At this time, we always take prayers from the congregation, which is such a special time. I love to hear what's going on with all of you. Does anyone have prayers they'd like to add in this morning? Well, I definitely want us to keep praying for the Ukraine. It looks like things are turning in the right direction there. So hallelujah for that. We've already lost so many lives to that unnecessary conflict. So it's never going to be a war. I think we can all agree with that. And I'm really pleased to be able to tell you things are going better for them. Is there anything else? Okay, let us pray. Lord Jesus, there are many hurting people in the world. Some may be on our hearts and minds silently. Some I was most certainly introduced to in my work at the hospital this past week. You know who they are. Some come and go in our lives and they're obviously people in pain, but they never really attach on to something stable. So we know them as people who come into our midst and blown out again, drifting. I ask you to be with those who need you. You know who those people are. I ask you to be with those who might be on our hearts and minds, perhaps in joy, perhaps just people we don't see that often that we love dearly or perhaps among your most needy. I ask you to tend to the people, the communities, the governments that you know are suffering and to be with all of us humbly as we beg your grace, knowing how much we need you. I'm so grateful that you are in our lives. We show our gratefulness by praying the prayer that you taught us, saying our Father, our Father, Lord, Lord in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us Just not into temptation, but deliver, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Reading today from scripture is from the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. It begins at Luke 23, verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed <clears throat> his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and he said, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the multitudes who assembled to see the sight, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance and they saw these things. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, 
who had not consented to their purpose and deed, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and he wrapped it in a linen shroud and he laid him in a rock hewn tomb where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, one said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the disciples. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So I caught a little typo in our bulletin this morning that is actually important to the sermon, so I will bother to mention it, which is the sermon title, which is grief and mourning as in part of or an aspect ritual of grief. It has been written as though it's good morning, but for the betterment of the audience, I will say to the congregation that what we're going to talk about is grief and mourning as in M O U R N mourn. Spell check. This Spell time, check this time of our 10 day morning is for the people of the United Kingdom specifically, such that last week we mentioned the Queen's death and we're still living it. I did not expect that when she died. I didn't realize there would be. 10 days of mourning as part of the rituals. I also didn't realize, and I'm still kind of grasping it, how important this would be to some people in America. Maybe you were surprised. I was very surprised. No. It no. feels as though some folks are really truly living very vicariously through this and that it has usurped any news story we could possibly have in the United States this week. It really oh, is. Yeah. It is what people are talking about. And you know, people mourn differently. Their grief comes out in different ways. There has been conflict this week on social media that I can't even describe to you about some of the dumbest stuff you can possibly imagine. Fighting about whether the service was Scottish or English, fighting about the role of the Presbyterians versus the Anglicans versus the Episcopal Church in the United States. While I have initially participated and then pulled back thinking I'm not so sure this honors the dead. This sort of conflict that people sometimes bring into moments of grief. I see it in the hospital all the time. And I'm always holding my head thinking, oh no, do we have to do this now? Entire families will get into huge conflict with each other. You'll have 15 people in an argument about who is driving Uncle Smith home. What you realize is a lot of these things are the tension of the moment. There isn't really a way to let off that pressure cooker. And so whether it's families or communities or countries, there is a fair amount of visible stress in the grieving process. The United Kingdom, of course, is filled with rituals and customs that are very unknown 
here in the United States. I certainly found that out when I lived there myself twice. It was incredible to walk into an entirely English speaking environment with a lot of people that looked a lot like me and realize that they had a whole world that was not American in culture at all. We can't really help but have some awareness of it as we see the press coverage of all of the different rituals of mourning, especially when a monarch dies for the British. Having not been monarchical here for a long time, again, a lot of this is foreign to many of us. But our press has figured out that the public worldwide is quite captivated by all of this. And so in both image and print, they are really churning out the stories. I must get 20 hits a day on something to do with the Queen of England's death. In fact, it's anticipated that her upcoming funeral will be the most watched event in human history. I find that really extraordinary when you stop and think just in your own lifetime, all the things that have happened that have garnered millions of press. And here we are being told the biggest is yet to come and that it will be very soon. When we look at history and then we look at what's happened in just like the last few days, I will say to you, I was especially moved by the live television images just recently of the Queen's eight grandchildren. This is not something you can really rehearse for, so to speak, and yet they formed into where her body is now laid and stood vigil at her coffin as one of the generational groupings of family, such as custom, to stand vigil at her coffin as though those folks had been practicing for this all their lives. They walked in military step, even though many of them have never served in the military. They bowed their heads in unison. It was just extraordinary to watch all of the different aspects of this. And then to realize the youngest of the eight is only 14. So many people in our own country really have very little marking their death at all. Here we have a woman who has already had at least 12 members of her immediate family and vigil at her coffin. The imagery is just so powerful. It is a tribute unlike most of us will ever see a second time. For me, it raises a lot of biblical images of grief and mourning. They are all through the Bible but we don't really talk about them that much. I think that people have a hard time with grief. They have a hard time with things that seem sad. And many are mourning their own thing. And the last thing they really want to dwell in is mourning in the Bible. But there is a sort of distinction between what is grief and what is mourning. Grief is the sadness, the confusion, <clears throat> maybe even the anger or the disaffectation, the distance that we feel at death. It's all of these different things rolled up into one. And in there is also love and joy, bittersweet memories. Grief is extremely complicated. It also doesn't have to be just about death. It can be another event that's marked by extreme losses. I work with many patients who have not died, but their cancer has gone on and on and on and has cost them in so many ways in their life that they are very much grieving, but they might be grieving all the different things that have happened along the way. The friend who couldn't cope with their illness and so distance themselves from the friendship, leaving the person feeling abandoned, the job, that they worked at for 20 years and are now just way too sick to do. The family members who start bickering because they're trying to cope, but that actually causes a lot of stress, and hurt and pain for the mother or the father or the sister or some other close relation who is there suffering. 
I just want to say someday, that's the patient. You people chill. But of course, I can't really do that. And everyone comes into that terrible time with their own pain. So you do, in fact, end up with grief manifold through a lot of different groups. Grief is not a one-time thing. It can be quite lasting. A supervisor I had very early on who worked with me in hospice, and this is going back like 25 years, she said it usually takes people about a year to start grieving. At the time I thought, oh brother, some of these are gonna go on forever. But as I've seen over my own professional work, it's very true because so many people that first year are hustling to make a new normal for themselves with that significant loved one gone. They haven't really even started the grieving. They're just trying to figure out how to close out the estate, how to handle the medical expenses, all of these practical things that keep you very busy when there is a significant death. They really haven't even started what grieving looks like. They're too busy to grieve. Mourning, on the other hand, in this context, is more centered on the rituals that accompany a death. We say that a person is in mourning, or we refer to a period of mourning as you may have heard with the queen's death, the 10 days that is her mourning period. Both grief and mourning are deeply personal. They look different from one person to the next and they are rooted in customs and they are also cultural. If we compare notes across our families, we might find out that even within the people here gathered, the way death is handled is very different. When I was earning a Master of Arts, I was at school in the United Kingdom, and that was the second time that I lived there. I lived in a large house that was set aside for international <clears throat> graduate students. It couldn't have been a better place for the university to stick me. One of the housemates in this large home, I think there were like 16 of us, one of the housemates was from Cameroon. His mother died and he returned to the village of his childhood where he had not been in many, many years, but he wanted to honor his mother and be present at her funeral. So he went back to Cameroon. He took photos, he took film. The rituals of dance, song and community and even the attire that each person dressed in, they were very formally dressed to honor her life. He told me that community that I could see in all these images was the entire village. The whole village stepped out to honor her life. It was different from anything I had ever seen. And it appeared to help him to talk about it and share the experience. And so I was only honored to be present and be interested. He needed that presence. He needed an audience, if you will, for his grief. Parts of the medical chaplaincy I do is similar to that. We have what we call anticipatory grief, and you may have heard that before. It may occur in some cases, and it occurs, as the name implies, without anybody having died. Just the trials of illness, the sense of loss that has already happened, or the possibility of an impending death may lead an individual, and not necessarily, I should say, the sick individual. It could be anyone around them as well. It could be the person or it could be their loved ones may lead them into this anticipatory grief. It is the anticipation of loss, the sadness of coming to accept what is happening that then leads to looking ahead and anticipatory grieving which is often a theme of my visits. This is a critical period of coming to acceptance of difficult things. It's often regarded as a sign of making good emotional progress. Just the stage of a very ill person losing their hair, which does not always happen, but that can be a loss that really creates a lot of grief. The passages of the Bible 
that are in today's reading are of value in a lot of different ways, but one is with regards to our biblical understanding of grief and mourning. More than one culture is a part of these <clears throat> verses, but ultimately we come to see one telling of the immediate aftermath of Jesus's crucifixion. In verse 48, those who had assembled as witnesses have just heard the centurion state his belief that Jesus was innocent of any crime. We are told they returned home, beating their breasts. At the time, such an action was done to show penance as a sort of confession of sin. Here, this is done as well as an act of grief and a show of sorrow. In verse 53, after Joseph of Arimathea has gone to Pilate and requested Jesus's body from off the cross. We see a wonderful example of Jewish rituals around death and burial. In traditional Judaism, what is today typical of Jewish custom, there is no cremation. There is always a burial. Here, Joseph takes the body of Jesus down from the cross he wraps him in a linen shroud and he lays him, we are told, in a tomb hewn from rock that has never been used. In verse 56, we are told that women traveling from Galilee went and prepared spices and ointments. Even to this very day, many religions and cultures include rituals of preparation of the body. Muslims, for example, even in the hospital, which many people don't realize, will normally honor the time of death by having a small number of family members, sometimes all women, come to the hospital and gather around the body, not just as the person is dying, but at the time that the nurse has said that it is okay to prepare the deceased. They come and they prepare the body for burial right there in the hospital. It is very, very lovingly done if you've ever had the opportunity to see this. They even do the cleaning of the body themselves. They will usually arrange that in advance and if they have not, the chaplain will sometimes be the person who reminds the medical team to check for that and allow for that. Sometimes a very beautiful joining of different groupings happens, whereby the patient's nurse is included. In cases where there are many tubes and machines, it is, of course, the nurse that withdraws those at the end but it is the Muslim family members who, as we see in our own scripture, come and clean the body lovingly and prepare it for burial after death. In the case of the scripture today, we know that the context is Jewish. We know that because verse 56 mentions not only the Sabbath, but also the commandments both of which were followed by Jews at the time. When we think about grief and mourning, we realize what an incredibly universal experience it is. And over time, we are learning more and more about it. We have come to learn, for example, that even some animals experience grief and mourning. Now, I have volunteered at the zoo in Tampa for about 11 years now. It's so hard to believe that, but it's been about 11 years. And one of the things you may have heard about on the news that is just so fascinating came out of the African continent and many of the reserves there are there for elephants. <clears throat> Animal behaviorists found that elephants have rituals that they observe of grief and mourning. 
One example of this is that when an elephant dies, it does not matter if they were with the herd or without the herd at the time. Elephants who are many miles away will come as a herd and visit that deceased elephant. And sometimes, particularly if the elephant has held a higher position in the herd, the elephants will stand vigil for a period of hours or even days around that deceased elephant that they are visiting. There really is no way to put this in a human context without thinking of it as a form of ritual mourning and grief. Once they had discovered about elephants, they started picking up more of this in other animals as well. They realized that there are rituals and expected outcomes through most of the primates, not only humans, but also apes, for example. And that there are rituals in much lesser forms among animals with lesser intelligence that are still, shall we say, feeling or emotion-oriented animals. So for example, if two dogs are raised together, the dog who lives will continue to look for the dog that has died, trying to understand where the dog went. There isn't the comprehension that illness may lead to death and that death will lead to invisibility. But there is that early stage. I say all of this because human beings at different ages are much the same way. A very, very small child, say maybe a two-year-old, will know that grandpa isn't there anymore, or even, heaven forbid, a parent isn't there anymore when there has been a death. But at that age, they really don't understand what death is or the conception. It's more like, where did he or she go? It is almost at that level of higher order animal, but very immature in faith and belief human. As the person grows, and this starts in childhood, by elementary school, children are asking very important questions about death, which makes it all the more amazing to think on what I mentioned in last week's sermon, that little Prince Louis at four years old, four, was able to say, well, at least she's with grandpa now about the queen. That is a child who has been raised by parents of Christian faith. There is no way that a four-year-old conceives of heaven unless it has been actively taught from birth. It brings me full circle to say that talking about grief and death and mourning is a tremendously important part of our lives and one that most of us, I think, shirk away from quite a bit. Some of the utter disasters, and there is no other nice way to put that, that I have seen in the hospital have been that person whose illness is actually very, very serious, but they have rolled along, sometimes for years, getting treatment and going in as though they're getting an oil change, right? Making everything seem routine to their loved ones, making it seem like they're just there for a checkup, making it seem like, oh, you know, there was an error in my blood work. I just need to go back and do some blood work. When that person makes the transition to where they are actively dying and will be dead, let's say within one week, those family members of that person completely dissolve in almost every case. The chaplains end up literally working overtime because there has not been any preparation for them that their loved one is this sick. Becoming more comfortable talking about our health. In the right time and place, I understand, but still having the conversations 
that ideally precede that ever happening is one of the greatest legacies we can give our loved ones. It doesn't even hinge on whether or not they're Christian. That can be part of our testimony. We can choose to put in the gospel as witnesses if that is not their belief. So don't be stopped by the relative religiosity or not of your loved ones, because that is really not the burden at this time. Your way of looking at death could very well convert somebody. You may be their Christian moment. It's really on you at that point, how you want to handle it. But I want to encourage you good folks today that grief and mourning do not have to be horrible experiences. They do not have to be the worst thing someone's ever gone through. A patient who communicates with their loved ones, who includes them, even so much as to say, things aren't going very well with this. I would appreciate you keeping me in prayer. That one moment can go such a long way to helping a loved one later accept if everything just goes downhill. One of the things that has really convinced me of this is that before I really worked as much as I do now at a cancer hospital, I worked for years in trauma. And so I was on a different kind of path of this topic because I was constantly seeing people who got to adjust to a death after it had already happened. They would get a call from the ER that their loved one was brought in on an ambulance. By the time they got to that ER, the loved one was already deceased. That was often no better than a frying pan in the face. It was such an incredible shock to people especially if it was a very young person, say like a motorcycle accident or a fall hiking, something that happened acutely as an event was often extremely hard for people to accept. When you have the opportunity to help your loved ones adjust, it is truly a blessing. It can be a blessing for you to still be alive while people show how much they love you and how much they will miss you. But moreover, you are giving them the greatest blessing possible by giving them the opportunity that they will breathe better long range, that they will come to peace at the loss of you. That peace takes so much longer if they have to handle disillusionment as part of this. The shock that people feel and the regret that people feel. Because most mourners experience it as, I guess he didn't trust me. I guess we weren't as close as I always thought we were. I guess he didn't really care about my feelings. I guess I wasn't as loved as I hoped to be. No one wants to leave their son, their daughter, their grandchild, their friend, thinking those things, especially when it's wrong almost every time. So I say to you, if we know this is how it's going to go, it is very important to communicate with our families in advance. The other day, my daughter, who was 16, said something I thought was so incredibly sweet to me. She was sitting by me and she just kind of started stroking my head. And I thought, well, this is interesting. And she suddenly said, when you are old, will you let me take care of you? I was so surprised, I can't even tell you. But I said, I would be honored if you wanted to take care of me. And she kept on stroking my head. And she said, does this feel good? I said, yeah, actually it does. 
And she said, well, I think I'm going to have to marry somebody big and strong so that he will be able to carry you when I'm taking care of you. Now, I can only think that she thought about this because there have been many deaths of very young people in the community in the last six months. I mean, I personally know of three different people ages 15 and 16 who have died. And that's a lot in that much time. Two were suicides. The 15 year old was hit by a car when he went to protect his little sister from getting hit first on the way to school. She lived and witnessed the entire thing. He was pronounced dead at the scene. These sort of young deaths of 10th and 11th grade kids are extremely hard on a community like Tampa Bay when they happen. You know, we're not in New York City. It's just not small. It's just not big enough here to absorb three different people dying under the age of 17. So of course it becomes something all of the kids are talking about. All the kids are feeling and having strong emotions about. And I really think that was a big factor in my daughter coming out of nowhere with this conversation with me. But I was reminded in that moment that we all have passing thoughts about frailty, infirmity, the end of life, and death. And yet we don't really talk about that much with each other. Our culture here in the United States is very uncomfortable with these topics. What a blessing we could be to our loved ones if we took the lead and made these a normalized part of life. What a blessing we could be if we include our loved ones, not just in our living, but in our moments of sadness, of weakness, and ultimately of end of life. Amen. I don't know if there are other announcements. There may very well be, but I did receive one announcement this morning, which is that our own church member, Fred, who went by Sonny Barch, passed away in August, and that they are planning to have a memorial service. So the word will be given out about that when it gets planned. Is there anything else anyone wants to announce? Nope. Okay, well, we can have a benediction then, I think. And now you holy people, you have not been brought here by accident today. You have been chosen to be here in this moment compelled by your faith in God and your desire to know the Lord more deeply. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.